Hey everybody, thanks for being here. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Welcome to Theory of Change. So uh, we've got another great live program here today and uh, we're live right now streaming on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Um, so please share the post or the tweet with your audience um, by retweeting it or sharing it on Facebook. Um, or posting it on YouTube, whatever we, whatever you can do to get people in here so we can get more audience uh, to participate. Um, and as always, we do, um, if you do have the any questions you have for our guest today, uh, be sure to ask them on whatever platform you're watching. So, um, and then I also did want to mention that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. And Flux is a new collective. Uh, it's a new community of podcasters and writers. And we cover politics and media and religion and technology uh, and how they all intersect with each other. So I hope you can check that out. The address is flux.community. So uh, without further ado, then um, I will get into the program. But uh, yeah, make sure to please retweet. Um, if you just saw the tweet come out on your timeline, make sure and retweet it so we can get more people in here. Um, all right. Well, let's get into the show then, shall we? Five years after it was written, the so-called Steele dossier, a collection of memos compiled by former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele, alleging extensive ties between Donald Trump and various Russians, is still one of the most talked about and heavily discussed pieces of writing about the ex-president. The document has come under intense scrutiny by American law enforcement and intelligence officials, and most of its sensational allegations about Trump have collapsed under examination. It's also become increasingly apparent that Russia's own intelligence officials became aware of what Steele was doing and began trying to manipulate him as he did it. And then the document itself has become the locus of a whole passel of far-right conspiracy theories. Um, alleging all kinds of strange and fanciful things, even more bizarre and intricate than anything that Christopher Steele ever imagined. So how much truth is in the Trump-Russia dossier will likely never be known, but the Steele document is actually part of a larger issue that has received almost no attention. And that is that the Steele memos were the product of multiple private intelligence services, a growing and very secretive industry that is built on the premise of collecting information at the behest of clients and then using that to generate news coverage without disclosing to the public where it came from. In, many recent, year, in recent years, many media outlets have been slashing their budgets for independent investigative reporting. Are private spy agencies filling this gap? And what does it mean if they are? Joining us to discuss this today is Barry Meyer. He's the author of Spooked, The Trump Dossier, Black Cube, and the Rise of Private Spies. Thanks for being here, Barry. Thanks, Matthew. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. All right. Well, so um, let me just get the title on the screen there so everybody can see that and also your Twitter information. Um, so we... Uh, it's a it's a complicated topic here that we're talking about. Uh, you have written a very intricate book, so I want people to be sure to check that out. Um, but before we go any further, though, let's maybe give a little bit of background about. Um, uh, I guess let's look at the history for a second here and uh, talk about how what the what what was in the Steele dossier, who, how did it come to be, who was he working for originally and then subsequently, uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So um, it, let's set this in the context of political opposition research, which is a phenomenon that has always taken place. Uh, uh, in years past, you'd have campaigns hiring students, volunteers to kind of go through old clip files and find embarrassing information. Uh, about an opponent. Then uh, during Bill Clinton's uh, presidential campaign, you had the first real use of professional private eyes uh, to dig up information. A and in this case, uh, they were used by both sides, but particularly by Bill Clinton's side 
to uh, try to do background checks and in, in some ways intimidate the women who were claiming that they had affairs with Bill Clinton. And sort of from that point forward over the past, you know, 30 years, it's been off to the races. And, and in every political campaign, you see the growing uh, involvement of private spies. You had that in uh, the Obama-Romney campaign where Fusion GPS, a firm that I'm sure we'll talk about more frequently during this show, uh, was hired by the Obama campaign to dig into Mitt Romney's uh, involvement with uh, Bain Capital and generate embarrassing stories about that. And then as the Republican uh, uh you know, campaign for the Republican nomination uh, started heating up. A uh, Fusion GPS was hired by a conservative uh, outlet, the Washington Free Beacon Foundation, uh, which is funded by Paul Singer, to basically gather oppo about Donald Trump uh, because um, Singer was was backing Marco Rubio a- as his preferred candidate. Uh, when Trump won the election. They then went and shopped their services to the Democratic Party, to the Hillary Clinton campaign. And that's when they hired Christopher Steele and what became known as the Steele dossier uh, began to take shape. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, and so, of course, Fusion GPS is not the only um, private intelligence service out there. Um, There are a bunch of other ones. and obviously, Christopher Steele had his own as well. Um, but there are there are quite a few other ones. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit about some of the ones you talked about in your book? Yeah, sure. I mean, there there are literally hundreds of these firms. You know, there's one man shops. There are smaller companies. There are major companies that have two to three hundred employees. Uh, in telling my, you know, in telling the story of the book and trying to tell the story of this industry, I tried to keep things relatively simple and focus the story on a few characters and a few companies. So the uh, characters and companies that I focused on were uh, Fusion GPS, which was founded by two ex-Wall Street Journal reporters, Glenn Simpson and Peter Fritsch, Orbis Business Intelligence, which was founded by Christopher Steele and another former MI6 operative, Um, Crowell Associates, formed by Jules Kroll, a very seminal figure in the history of the modern day corporate intelligence industry, and uh, Black Cube, uh, the Israeli firm, uh, which became notorious because of its involvement in the um, Harvey Weinstein case. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, well, and I guess, yeah, let's maybe get into that, the Weinstein side. What? So he... Um, just to review for people who aren't familiar, uh, Harvey Weinstein, you know, was, uh, he's been accused of, of harassing and, uh, assaulting, you know, dozens of women, uh, he's actually over the years. Convic- he's actually and been convicted. convicted. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I was going to say, but yeah, oh, he's been accused of far <laughs> more than he was convicted of. Right. Um, and so, uh, and people wondered why, how was it that he was able to get away with this for so long? Um, and it, it was basically that he had hired various uh, private intelligence services to intimidate um, the women that he had victimized. Uh, isn't that right? Well, I mean, you know, Harvey Weinstein, I, I would say if there was one particular reason why Harvey Weinstein got away with it for so long, was the insularity of Hollywood and its power in Hollywood and and the unwillingness of, you know, actors, uh, agents, lawyers, whomever, to to tangle with him for fear that they would get blackballed from the industry. But when things really started uh, coming to a head, when it became clear that, you know, his power was, you know, that, that, that he was being investigated uh, by uh, Ronan Farrow at The New Yorker, by uh, two former colleagues of mine at The New York Times. Uh, that's where things really started to ramp up in terms of his use of uh, private investigators. And, you know, the, the most 
sort of uh, aggressive of those firms was Black Cube. Uh, and, you know, what they did was, you know, or what, you know, their sort of modus operandi is to adopt these uh, digital and actually physical pretexts where they pretend to be other people. They approach targets, in this case, uh, the, the, some of the actresses that were making allegations against Harvey Weinstein, and they seek to get compromising information or information from them that can be used to compromise them if they testify in a lawsuit or black, you know, using as some kind of mm -hmm. legal. Um, well, and some of these, cudgel. yeah, and some of these groups will also try to uh, fish with reporters. Um, oh yeah, and try to to find out what they know by posing to and pretending to be people pertinent to their investigations as well. Right, or even like feed them information. One mm -hmm. to get negative stories going about. Oh yeah, well we'll talk about, about that targets or later. Or yeah. yes, or or um, you know, there's a whole array of techniques which we can talk about later on that these firms use to intersect with reporters uh, and glean information. Yeah. Um, okay, and so um, one of those firms, as um, well, I guess before we get too far into it, so. Just for those who are not familiar with your background, Barry, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know what you were doing uh, before you wrote the start getting in, into writing books and your background in investigations and things like that. So I I spent I'm retired now, but I spent most of my career in the newspaper industry, uh, mainly doing investigative report reporting, often in the health and sub public safety arena. Uh, I worked uh, originally for the Wall Street Journal, then for uh, New York Newsday, a sadly now defunct newspaper in New York City. And then I went to the, to the New York Times in 1989 and, and stayed there until 2018. So that's 28 or 29 years. I've, I've kind of lost track. Uh, over the course of uh, time, I read a lot of stories I think were significant, that I think were a public benefit. I, I uh, was the first reporter to write, report extensively about OxyContin, um, Purdue Pharma, and the Sackler family. And, and in 2003, I published a book called Painkiller that, that first chronicled that whole story. Um, subsequently, I published about Almost 15 years, uh, 12 years later, I published uh, my second book, Missing Man, which was about the case of Robert Levinson, a former uh, FBI agent turned private investigator who disappeared in Iran. It was a very high profile case. I, you know, people might be familiar with him from seeing photographs of this guy in an orange jumpsuit with very long hair and a beard uh, and Sadly, his, um, the government, U.S. government, told his family about a year ago that they believe he perished at some point in captivity. And then when I was leaving the Times, or about to leave the Times, um, I do two, did two things of note. Uh, I broke what may have been one of the crazier stories <laughs> of my reporting career, which was about uh, the Nexium cult, or, or that cult near Albany, New York, uh, where women were being branded with the initials of its founder. And um, uh, I also decided that, you know, okay, I'm leaving daily journalism. What's my next step? And along with uh, updating um, Painkiller to reflect the many, many developments that had happened since I first you know, wrote the book, I decided, you know, it'd be a good time to look at the corporate investigations industry because there were three big stories happening uh, in late, you know, in 2017, in, in the run up to my retirement. One was the dossier. One was the Harvey Weinstein story. And the third one was uh, the story of Theranos uh, and Elizabeth Holmes. And, and the kind of thread that connected 
all of them was the involvement of these corporate investigations firms, uh, you know, working on behalf of lawyers or companies or, or powerful people. And uh, I thought, wow, these people are having a kind of unseen influence on the media, business, and our personal lives. And it would be, you know, interesting and fun to kind of investigate them. And, and that became the sort of operating theory behind Spooked. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. And so I guess, uh, well, let, let's maybe get into then the, um, the Steele side of things here. So, so Christopher Steele, he, uh, give us a real quick, quick background on who Christopher sure. Steele is. So Christopher Steele, uh, a Brit, uh, product of Cambridge, um, wanted, it turned out, or was toyed with the notion of becoming a journalism journalist uh, when he left, but decided to become a private spy. Dur during his MI6 career, he was posted for a few years in the 1990s in Moscow, kicked around, uh, then came back to headquarters in London and eventually rose to become the head of the Russia desk, uh, an analytical desk. Uh, so, and that's the British equivalent of the yeah, British equivalent of the CIA, of excuse me. Yes. Yeah. The overseas yeah. intelligence yeah. service. Um, and so he, like many former spies, FBI agents, journalists, prosecutors, you name it, who are like either retiring or have left their line of work for economic reasons or to seek greener pastures, you know, find themselves in this corporate investigations industry because they bring certain skills to it. You know, they're, they, they have connections, they may know about writing, they may have investigated stuff during uh, their previous careers, they may have special subject areas of expertise, there may be cybersecurity experts, who knows. Uh, and he and a, another MI6 guy who had just retired formed a very small uh, private investigations firm in London called Orbis Business Intelligence. And the thing to keep in mind is that London is one of the real epicenters of the global corporate investigations industry. And that's in part because uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, many oligarchs, uh, from Russia or the former Soviet republics moved to London to set up shop and then began, began to get involved in, you know, lawsuits and disputes and you name it against each other. And so there was plenty of work for corporate investigators to kind of dig up dirt or do research on behalf of the various lawsuits and gripes these guys had. And that's the kind of line of work that Christopher Steele found yeah. himself. Well, and it's an outgrowth also that uh, the UK has had a, a, you know, very, very long history as being a, a hub of the legal industry as well, I would say. Uh, yeah, that too. And, and, and the UK also has a much more, um, as it turns out, though it's kind of hard to believe, a uh, much more lenient attitude towards the type of evidence that can be introduced in civil lawsuits uh, than we do here in the U.S. I mean, they can like put in hack stuff, the paid witnesses oh, yeah. testify. It's really quite startling. Well, and they have much lower standards for libel if you're a plaintiff. Exactly. That compared too. Compared to the United States. That too. Um, so anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so Christopher Steele is kind of bouncing around. And uh, one of the things he, one of the jobs he's hired for is by a British a group of business group, excuse me, a group of British businessmen, who are eager to bring the uh, FIFA, the the World Soccer Championships, to England, and they get outbid by uh, Russia for I forgot which 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 games they were, and they're going like, uh oh, well, we kind of know FIFA's sort of corrupt. We're not sure about it, but boy, it seems like there's a lot of money changing hands there. So they hire Christopher Steele 
uh, to work on their behalf, investigating FIFA. And uh, Christopher Steele uh, connects with a, a, a British journalist who actually broke the FIFA story and brings him to the attention of the FBI, which is also interested in corruption in FIFA. And thus began a relationship between Christopher Steele and the FBI, or at least one agent in the FBI, under which, um, you know, Christopher Steele became a paid source uh, for the FBI and would, you know, sell them information or set up meetings between them and people that with whom they wanted to speak or who with whom uh, or people who wanted to speak to the FBI. And that often was oligarchs who wanted uh, some favors from the FBI in exchange for information. Um, yeah. Okay. And then, um, and then after that, he, uh, was, you know, continuing to try to get various clients and things like that. And, um, then we can fast forward to the, uh, to 2015, um, as you mentioned, um, earlier that, um, there's, so Donald Trump, it's, um, it's, um, you know, so much happened while he was the president and, and when he ran for the presidency the first time, but, it's important to remember that when he first was out there, uh, the right wing political establishment hated him. Um, right. They hated right. him very, very desperately because, right. you know, he actually, especially in the primaries, was campaigning on kind of a moderate progressive type uh, platform. Um, and so he was saying he was going to raise the carried interest loophole. He was saying that Republican politicians were just beholden to their donors and did whatever they said. He was saying that he wanted to have, he said that he liked Canada's uh, socialized uh, health care system. Um, he said that it worked great and that he wanted to copy it. So they, these uh, right wing American oligarchs, um, they, they never get called oligarchs. Funny how only the Russians do. Um, I mean, so these American oligarchs decided that they had to do something to get rid of Trump uh, because they thought he was they thought he was either going to lose to Hillary Clinton in 2016 or if he won, he was actually going mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. unravel some some of their elaborate coalition building. And so um, one of the things that so I guess one of the other things just for background for people who aren't aware is that so in on the American right. There is no, despite how they constantly are criticizing the mainstream media for alleged liberal bias, they themselves have no interest in mainstream media themselves that they right. operate themselves. Right. So like Fox right. News is not at all, is like much more biased to the right than any, you know, allegedly liberal outlet is to the left. Um, and so, but one of the things that they've done with these uh, American right wing billionaires is that they've created media institutions that are designed to sort of platform their ideology, their personal particular idea set. So you've got Phil Anschutz, who created the Washington Examiner, Rupert Murdoch, who uh, created the Weekly Standard, and then that was later sold to Philip Anschutz, uh, another right-wing billionaire, uh, who tried to make it more of a, you know, Christian-oriented type thing. Um, uh, and then... You have other uh, organizations, one of them, as you said earlier, the Washington Free Beacon, which is this uh, pretty small um, online publication, doesn't have a big audience. But what they do have is the money of Paul Singer, this uh, right wing investment maker who has been basically he, sho he shovels money into this organization to to pay for investigations. And so they have some reporters who do investigations but they also pay external uh, private intelligence firms. And one of them was uh, Fusion GPS. And, Correct. And that is, uh, so can, can you talk about that background and, and, and how sure. they yeah, first started? I, I mean, I think that, that the thing that is uh, fascinating about uh, Fusion GPS and Paul Singer is that, you know, Fusion GPS, you know, wasn't, didn't, come alive in 2015. And, and one of the things I 
try to do in the book is, you know, trace the the firm and its activities since its founding, and, which was not that long ago in, in 2010, uh, and, and look at its clients, you know, and so Theranos was a client, uh, and um, this Russian real estate, Russian-owned real estate company called Prevazone, which got, you know, in, in a twist with uh, Bill Browder, the, the person who brought about the Magnitsky Act, was a client. And so was Paul Singer in, uh, in his capacity as the operator of this gigantic vulture fund, which, which tried to, you know, muscle, you know, would buy up distressed debt from foreign governments, Argentina being one example. I believe Ghana was another example. Uh, and try to muscle them into paying as much as possible on on this defaulted debt. So you had a history of um, of Glenn Simpson and and Peter Fritz, the the operators of Fusion GPS, uh, working for Paul Singer. And when um, when the Washington Be Free Beacon went looking around uh, for someone to do oppo research on Trump. Uh, to try to torpedo him and, and, and foster the campaign of Marco Rubio, the singer back candidate, uh, Fusion GPS was a natural firm for them to turn to. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, th and that was when they brought um, Christopher Steele in as well, right? No, he would not get oh. brought in until... Essentially, oh, until, I, yeah, about nine months until later, later yeah. once they start working for the Democrats. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, so basically at that time, Fusion was mostly just trying to aggregate information from Correct. news clippings and things like Correct. that. Correct, correct. Um, but, but it is crucial to note that they actually do do private investigations for uh for Free Beacon and the Washington Free Beacon uses other services as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's it, they go where the money is. That's where all these companies. I mean, we're not talking about people with um, a particularly strong moral compass. We're talking about people who take whatever jobs uh, are offered to them for the most part. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, uh, but then Trump uh, basically becomes the presumptive Republican nominee and. Uh, Fusion GPS wants to keep making money off of this uh, anti-Trump stuff. So then they go over to the Democrats and say, hey, you know, we've got some things here that we have on Trump um, and we could do a lot more uh, for you um, to go against him in the general election. Um, and so uh, the Democratic National Committee uses a kind of a complicated arrangement to hire them without disclosing that they were hiring them. Um, and then subsequently Fusion GPS goes and brings in Christopher Steele and his uh, private intelligence service as well. So it's it's uh, wheels within wheels in a sense, right? Um, and so uh, Steele then goes over to meet, we actually goes to the United States to meet with a bunch of people um, to try to find information. and. Um, Tell us about what we know about his process um, at, you know, five years after the fact. And in terms of... I, I think we, what we know is that it was, I guess, scant uh, might be the most uh, polite and positive word you could use. Uh, shoddy might be a substitute word. Um amateurish might be another word. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a whole spectrum of words that you could use to, to describe his research gathering process and his vetting process, but none of them are particularly complimentary. Um, so what he does, he doesn't go over to Russia himself, uh, in part because he can't. He, he's uh, you know, a former British spy. He's been in Russia. They know who he is. And so they he, obviously are not going to let him in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And plus, if they do, they're going to be monitoring him, you know, every step of the way. So what yeah. he does is that he recruits or has already recruited for other jobs, 
a, a guy who um, was a one-time researcher, analyst, research analyst at the Brookings Institute, or, uh, someone who was born in Russia, who speaks Russian, but is basically living in the United States now, by the name of Igor Danchenko. And Igor Danchenko uh, technically is what's known within the corporate investigations industry as a subcontractor, someone who is not a direct employee, uh, salaried employee of, of an investigations firm, but, but someone who's hired on a job by job basis uh, to go out and do stuff. And, and often the people who are subcontractors of uh, corporate investigations firms are people who have uh, failed, uh, flunked out, um, whatever, in their previous career choices, run into a dead end, and are scrambling around looking to sell whatever skills they have uh, to keep their head above water. And, and in Igor Janchenko's case, it was uh, that he was an, a native Russian and, and a Russian speaker. Uh, so he goes over there. And, you know, in Christopher Steele's uh, description of, hi, of him, as at least in reflected, as reflected in this book, Crime and Progress, that Glenn Simpson and Peter Fritsch wrote, was that, like, this guy was, like, the most talented, you know, intelligence gatherer he had ever worked with in his career. You know, he was, like, a kind of super sleuth. And so Igor would go over there, he would talk to people, he would fly back to London, sit down with Christopher Steele, verbally relay the information that he was picking up, and then Christopher Steele would write it up into kind of like these, you know, spy world reports. You know, they kind of look like, well, this is right out of the files of MI6, because, you know, people were being referred to not by not by their real names, but not even by nicknames. But, you know, there was like source A and source B. And well, source or D. even really a description. And well, there'd be some were. slight description. Source yeah, D, not, not who's wired into the Kremlin or source E, who's a top tier uh, something or other, you know, with Kremlin connections. But, you know, kind of getting across the idea that these people were heavy hitters. And, and they know of what they spoke. And, and those memos, of which I believe there were 16 or 17, mm -hmm. became what we refer to as the dossier because they were basically sent uh, one at a time they were, yeah. over, over a period of, I believe, five months from Christopher Steele to Fusion GPS. And then at a certain point, Christopher Steele also began giving them to the FBI. Yeah. Well, and... So, and before we get in further into that, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, the documents went on to, you know, become the subject of great interest in 2015, 2016. Um, but they, uh, I, I, I think people kind of on, on both the left and the right kind of misunderstand that they're proper significance or what they really mean and why their importance is actually what matters. Like why people regarded them as important is more important than what they actually said, um, is what I would say. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I think, you know, they, they fed into people's assumptions. I mean, I think that's, that's the import that they took on. Uh, they really burst into public view uh, in early 2017 when BuzzFeed posted them Online. I mean, they had been kicking around before. Oh, they were, yeah, privately much. Yeah, they were kicking similar. around. Uh, uh, they were being shopped to major media outlets, the New York Times, among them. And, uh, you know, uh, they just were, um, you know. They were they, all. They, they fed people's, yeah, they fed privately. people's preconceptions. I mean, like, look. Yeah. Um, Trump was someone who lots of people didn't like. And I, I would not exclude myself from that category. I mean, you know, here's a guy who was uh, sexist, racist, horrible, uh, long string of business failures, Corrupt. you know, a yeah. business, it like scam people going to this stupid university, selling all these direct products, um, so on and so forth. And so, you know, the idea 
that that he would kind of like try to get one over by forming common cause with Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, like when you thought of Trump and Trump of what Trump had done and, and what he was capable of doing, this didn't seem that far off. I mean, even today you have a man who's trying to damage our democracy by contending a fair and free election didn't happen because he didn't win it. So, you know, if you're dealing with supporters to go and march on the Capitol. Yeah. And so if you're dealing with someone Uh, that perverse and that toxic and that terrible, you know, uh, maybe this is something he would be doing. Yeah. So, you know, it, it certainly had that appeal to many, many people. Yeah. Well, and um, so, but yeah, his practices as it's come out, you know, just Steele's practices were just really terrible. Um, and, you know, there was some indication, I think, within the, when his memos were circulating privately. Um, so they, you know, he had, he had written them individually for several months and, 2015 through 2016, um, and people were, you know, affiliated with the with the Democratic National Committee or the Hillary Clinton campaign. They were kept they kept trying to pitch reporters on them. Fusion GPS kept trying to to give it to reporters, um, and nobody took the bait. Nobody wanted to do it. Um, now you were not one of those reporters that they right. had contacted. Um, right. But they were definitely trying to get these into the New York Times. Uh, can yes, you talk about yes, that, absolutely. How that was? Sure. So, uh, you know, most people think, um, and I, I won't say, you know, maybe it is a right wing media meme that, you know, there's like this media conspiracy on the left or mainstream. You know, New York Times is part of uh, some media conspiracy. And it's kind of absurd as someone who worked there because, number one, Half the time, you know, people in one office of the New York Times have no idea what people in another office of the New York Times are working on. And that was a perfect example was the dossier. I mean, you know, I was in New York. My colleagues and I were working on a story about Paul Manafort, uh, the story that about the, the so-called Black Ledger that led to Manafort's dismissal uh, from the campaign in mid-2016. None of us had any idea about the dossier. There was a small group of people in Washington, in our Washington office, who it had been pitched to, but we knew nothing about it. Uh, So, uh, you know, I think what happened, and I kind of try to reconstruct this in the book, um, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC News, others were like, so, oh, wow. This is interesting. Maybe it's true. And they set out to find out, you know, to like report this out to try to see if they could independently confirm some of the most significant aspects of the dossier, such as uh, Michael Cohn's meeting in Prague, supposed meeting in Prague with Russian operatives. And they came up you know, crapped. I mean, everything crapped out. There was nothing that they could find. In fact, um, they were finding, and, and, and I know I, I write about this in the book, like ABC was finding that there was stuff in the dossier that was just factually wrong. I mean, there was a contention that Michael Cohn's father-in-law uh, had a DACA outside of Moscow, Right. Well, well, yes. Now, what's a, what's a DACA? Oh, it's a, like a, a resort home, you know, a second home. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of like, I guess it's the, the Hamptons of Moscow, you know, this area where there are wealthy second homes, um, weekend homes. And, yeah. uh, uh, and so they sent someone there to check, a stringer there to check it out. And it turned out, yeah, there was someone who owned a home in the area who had the last same last name as Michael Cohn's father-in-law, 
but it was just someone with the same, same last name as Michael yeah. Cohen's father-in-law. And, you know, it's that kind of sloppiness. I mean, just to, to close a bow on Christopher Steele, um, I'm not saying this is, you know, our last comment about him, but, you know, one of the things that I've spoken about that I wrote about that I remain continually amazed by, uh, you know, as a reporter, we make it our effort to try to get to the original source of information. I mean, we, we don't deal whenever possible in secondhand information. So if you tell me, hey, Barry, I've heard something. And I would, so I'm going to say to you, well, who did you hear that from, Matthew? And could you put me in touch with that person? And then I will go and see that person and see, one, are they credible? And two, is, is what you're telling me they said to you what they actually said to you? And in no case that I've been able to find did Christopher Steele ever do that with any of the people that were giving information to his uh, collector, Igor Danchenko. And in many ways, Christopher Steele uh, finds himself now in this sort of embarrassing and catastrophic situation with, this, uh, with the indictment of Igor, Igor Danchenko because he didn't do the simplest thing, which was to yeah. basically go and check up on the people that were providing Danchenko with information. I mean, that's sort yeah. of like reporting 101, and, and he was yeah. unwilling to do that. Yeah, although, you know, I would say I think it does illustrate the difference in his background versus in investigative reporting. So, like, in, in, for intelligence agencies, they just simply collect information. They don't, as, it, as something that is circulating or something that people are considering uh, in a particular community or whatever it is. So um, that's, that's what they do. Like, mm -hmm. and then only higher up the chain, do you have people, you know, in the actual administrative level who have to say, okay, well now we have to see, is this true? Are these things true? Um, and then, you know, the highest standard of proof of course is you know, when you're in a court um, where if, if there's a crime that you're pursuing as the prosecutor, you actually have to have, you know, concrete evidentiary um, standards that you have to follow, like your formal rules of procedure, um, and and so these are these are things that Christopher Steele, as a as a person, never really had any experience at any of this stuff, um, and so he had lower standards from the beginning, and uh, you know, as people get more and more into his work, that becomes more and more apparent. I well, think. it's clear that he had lower standards. I guess what I would take some exception with is the idea that Christopher Steele, and I have no reason to doubt this, I'm, I'm accepting it, Christopher Steele, Glenn Simpson, Peter Fritsch, they all claim that, you know, we did what we did because we believe this represented a real threat to democracy. We felt we were duty bound to take this information and get it into whatever channels we could, be it government channels or media channels or whatever the case may be. But if you believe in your heart that an individual is a puppet of a foreign government and a threat to our democratic way of life, I would argue that irregardless of what your... Uh, background or training is that you might want to get up off of your ass and get out of your office and start doing some on the ground reporting. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I think that's a, a, a good point and it's relevant in another context here that um, because Steele's work and Fusion GPS's work was so shoddy, it completely overshadowed a lot of legitimate confirmed facts about Donald Trump. Um, yes. So like we knew it is a fact that Donald Trump was trying to get a uh, Trump tower in Moscow. It is a fact. Yes. Uh, and he was doing that while he was running for president and that he lied about not having business ties to Russia. Like, and it is interesting, a fact. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Interestingly, uh, 
you know, it was well known for many years and, and well publicized for many years that Donald Trump was trying to get a development in Moscow. What is kind of phenomenal also about Steele's dossier is that there's no mention of, of uh, uh, he, he didn't pick up. His sources were so bad, so ill-informed that they didn't pick up uh, the effort that Trump was doing to try to get a deal going in Moscow. Yeah. They were so ill-informed and disconnected, they knew nothing about the Trump Tower meeting between this Russian lawyer and Donald Trump Jr., and, you know, like they were like like a stupid PR guy for a Russian rock musician knew about it. So why didn't Christopher Steele? I mean, it's absurd. The things that he didn't know about were very yeah. important things. Uh, partic and, and the things he claimed to know about were, in many cases, bogus. Yeah. Well, and... In terms of let's maybe talk a little bit about some other bona fide facts about Trump and Russia that have gotten kind of overshadowed besides the Trump Tower, um, if you want to get into that. Well, I, I think, you know, there are, in my mind, things that are indisputable. Number one, that Russia tried to influence or meddle in the 2016 election. That was bipartisan finding of the Senate. That was also a finding of the Mueller report. Uh, what I and find, even Trump himself actually has admitted that a couple of times. What, what I find <laughs> very disheartening is that, you know, commentators or Mao Mauers on the right and on the left are now taking these uh, controversies over the accuracy of the dossier and trying to rewrite history. By saying that, well, I, I guess this means that, that the Russians didn't try to meddle or that yeah. Trump didn't invite their meddling. So, you know, you have this, you know, particularly on the right wing, but to some degree on the left wing, this effort to kind of sanitize it like, oh, the Russians, well, that must have just been a fantasy, you know, Um uh, so that was damaging. I mean, that is the continuous, continuous, continuing damage of this episode. It was very damaging during the Trump administration because Trump could then turn around and say, oh, it's, you know, the Russia stuff. You know, it's just another example of how they're after me. And another became, hoax, another yeah. hoax, another what, and kind of use that to, as a cover uh, to cover up all the horrible things he actually was doing, you know, like yeah. lying, lying to us about the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I, I think it had a very, very, very damaging uh, effect, uh, both on politics, the media, and public and civil civic discourse. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, now, and I guess I would say, though, that this kind of did not just with Steele's work, um, but it, the mainstream media in some outlets also did in their pursuit of stories about Trump did seem to have some lower standards sometimes on some stories. Like, for instance, um, early on, actually, before he had taken office, there was this claim um, in the Washington Post that that Russia had hacked had tried to hack the American power grid um, of the United States. And turned out it was just some schmuck had a, had stupidly put a, a virus on their computer. Um, and it wasn't a computer that was even connected to the grid in any way. Um, and like there were, there were several stories like this that had kind of, uh, you know, been reported with big fanfare and just ended up fizzling. And it's important, I think, for people who are Trump critics to understand that, you know, when you are dealing with somebody who attacks the concept of objective truth entirely, like, then tells people the only tr time that you can get the truth about me is from me. Um, when you're dealing with somebody who has that sort of totalitarian 
vision to his followers, you have to have everything, you know, in li- you know, line. You better be line. right. You have to dot every I and cross every T, and you have to be right, as you said. Um, and because otherwise, you you're actually helping him when you're well, shot. You know, we we are, and I don't I don't know to what degree this is a, a product of Trump uh, or the Trump era. Although I suspect it's 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 a con- major contributor to it. Um, you know, uh, I, I've given up on, on cable news for the most part because I don't want to hear people hectoring about stuff, lecturing about stuff, uh, bloviating about stuff, commentating about mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, we, we've moved, and I guess, you know, although he is a, uh, a controversial figure himself, Matt Taibbi, you know, um, wrote a book called hate and um and i think uh rachel maddow and what's his name from fox was on the cover uh the guy who looks like he's tucker carlson no no like cut out of like cut out of a square is square headed guy um oh sean hannity sean Sean hannity Hannity, okay yeah uh you know uh these people, you know, they've they have got their followers and their audience. Their audience is not going to learn anything from them that they don't want to hear. They're not going to tell their audience anything that's actually going to inform them. They're just going to feed their audience stuff that you know feeds into their pre-existing uh, mm-hmm. ideas and beliefs, and and it's terrible. It really is terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're, we're like, you know, this is not what, you know, this, it, this does not re- represent public discourse in any way, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, and um, there's even still some people who are trying to hold out hope for, for Steele, <laughs> that maybe his stuff is still right. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Unfortunately, I've, I'm seeing people who who are who are still saying that. Um, well, well, let's let's uh, have them on, or let's see what they have to say. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and then, um, but it's also and and on on the other side that um, and and by the way, you know, some people might say, oh, well, this is you're engaging in in both sides inappropriately, you know, um, casting aspersions on an authoritarian, you know vision of reality versus some cable TV hosts. Are you, would you, what would you say to that accusation? I, I'm not, I don't know what uh, you have to interpret what that accusation means. I'm not quite sure what you're saying by that. I mean, I'm saying that, so you're, you're, uh, in other words, if you're telling people to not just watch things that confirm your prejudices, you're not saying that various hosts on, CNN or MSNBC are anywhere morally the equivalent of Tucker Carlson, you know, who is a Buddhist no. I'm not saying that at all. People. I'm not saying um, that at all. I'm not saying that yeah. you know. Look, you can you can have um, ideologues, and you can have horrible ideologues. Okay, they're all ideologues. Uh, one might be like really a lot more toxic and horrible than another one, but. The people on CNN or MSNBC, they're also ideologues. Um, and I, I'm just not going to endorse them <laughs> mm-hmm. as, you know, m- I prefer these ideologues to this horrible, toxic ideologue. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just, I, I don't. You're, I, you're saying people need to think for themselves. Well, um, I think, you know, we, got, orders, yeah, we have to sort of like, like. We are in this situation because we are, we become creatures of teams, right? We're playing on a team. We think we're part of this team. We have people that reinforce our beliefs that we're part of the team. And it's damaging. It's, we see the destruction of, of it in our lives and, you know, debates over vaccination, debates over school policies, debates over voting rights, debates over, you name it. It's like, 
out there everywhere. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm an old guy right now. And, you know, I never imagined that when I was young and, and I thought, wow, there's going to be peace and love uh, somewhere in the future to, that, that I would become an old man when it, there was hatred and anger as a prevailing sentiment afflicting our society. And, uh, but that's, that's my personal view. I mean, it's just, it's, it's uh, constantly eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess uh, let's maybe rewind the discussion here a bit in terms of looking at um, some of these private research entities and uh, from the right putting stuff into the media. So one thing that, and that almost has evaporated from the public discourse is how Steve Bannon, the Trump advisor, uh, had set up this nonprofit organization, which uh, was basically kind of doing the same thing as Fusion GPS, the Government Accountability uh, Institute, or I forget the exact name. Um, and uh, basically they did a bunch of you know, digging of information and uh, tried to, and released it actually in a book and with collaboration of the New York Times um, through this book that was called Clinton Cash. And turns out a lot of the things that they were alleging did not really hold up to scrutiny either. Um, you can talk about that episode a little bit. Sure. Well, I, I, I can't talk about it from any position of knowledge or authority. Because sure, yeah, you were not involved with it. Yeah. I wasn't involved with it. I wasn't part of the reporting on it or the writing of it. Uh, all I can say is that as a, you know, a reader of the New York Times, uh, I was kind of stunned uh, to see it. And as an employee of the New York Times, I certainly didn't feel it represented our finest hour. Um, why they did it, whether they, you know, that the, sometimes news organizations feel that, okay, well, and I'm, I'm hypothesizing here. They feel like, okay, people perceive us as liberal. They perceive us as pro-Hillary. They perceive us as pro-democratic, whatever the case may be. Well, maybe we got to give them a little slap. You know, we got to slap them a little once in a while just to let everyone know that we're not. Right. You know, so, so God knows if it was a uh, a reflection of that. I don't know. I mean, I think there's always this feeling like, well, uh, you know, I had I was doing a story one time with a very fine reporter uh, who is fortunately still at the Times and an editor came up. And, and you know, this is this reporter was about a horrible person <laughs> affiliated with the Trump. Uh, administration and this uh, editor came up to us and said you know very uh, I don't think you know we're gonna have to like edit this piece a little bit because you know people are gonna expect us to be critical of members of the Trump administration and you know this is just like playing into stuff i'm going like what the fuck are you talking about we're we reported the story this guy's like has like kind of a checkered history and that's what this is about and so you know there's this this second guessing that goes on with you know how is the reader the public going to perceive us as a news organization um for running a story, right? Uh, and that's an unfortunate place to be because we should only run the stories that are worthy of running, uh, regardless of whether they are pro or anti or whatever, the, the administration or a particular political party. So that's that's my basic feeling about it. I mean, I, I've never, I saw, I mean, that's probably the only experience of that I had at the times, but, um, uh, it was a memorable one. Yeah. Well, what was the reaction in the building after that came out and kind of collapsed? Sorry, my dog's here. Oh, sorry, um, my, mine's after, here too. Yeah. But fortunately, he's not. I have earphones, so he can't hear you, dog. Uh, um, I, you know, yeah. I don't know because I, I, to be 
totally honest, I, I don't know. That's number one. I would guess that, uh, like, I don't want to compare it to the dossier reaction, but, you know, I think reporters, like many people, you know, when a story kind of fizzles, they kind of go, okay, well, let me just walk about away from that one and move on, and maybe no one is going to really uh, call me out on it. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so I, I'm bringing that up, and, you know, so maybe that you're talking about that maybe they thought they should throw the right wing a bone by doing it. Um, I mean, so how... You, you know, you're you're talking about how journalists need to be pursuing truth and um, not be beholden to various sides or partisans. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they should the Times shouldn't have done this collaboration with Steve Bennett. So, like, how how can you how can you trot that line? Um, well, I, I think uh, I think you know, uh, without speaking to specifically. To that story, because to be frank, again, I, I wasn't involved with it. I have no idea what the thought process was. I don't know. I have nothing, no idea about what the decision process was. More broadly and generally, uh, and this is something I read about in the book, I, I think it's very important for news organizations to kind of reframe its interactions with private operatives and private spies. I mean, you know, part of the big embarrassment that uh, the Washington Post is experiencing now and others are going to experience with the dossier is that, you know, they didn't attribute this information to Fusion GPS or Christopher Steele or whomever they were getting it from. They were just saying, you know, like to sources or to a person familiar with the situation. And, you know, it was clear to anyone with half a brain that they were getting this stuff from, from Fusion. And, uh, you know, I think. Well, and the Post has actually having had, they've been having to go back through their. Yes, but they're still not identifying the sources, which I can understand. They're still not yeah. identifying. They're, 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 they've run large corrections on those stories. Yeah. But, you know, like for the reporters, getting back to like, well, maybe they thought they could walk away from those stories without any backlash. You know, because mm -hmm. I wrote about all those stories in my book and raised questions about Danchenko's claims in my book and the sources, how those stories were being sourced, both in the Washington Post and in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, I basically got they blew me off. But now, you know, here we are. It's like, you know, a couple of months after my book appeared and the reporters who were involved are probably wishing to themselves I wish I never agreed to what Fusion asked of me, which was don't disclose us, keep us away from this article, don't mention our name in this story. And I think first and foremost, to prevent this kind of stuff from happening, you know, those rules of engagement have to be dictated now by journalists, not by private operatives or private spies. We can't let them set the rules of the game. We set the rules of the game. And if they want to play in our space, they have to follow them. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess, uh, you know, since Steele's work has just collapsed, um, the far right has now embraced uh, the Steele dossier, but in a different way, creating all sorts of elaborate conspiracy theories about yeah, it. Yeah, it's all, you, um, you know, it's all toxic garbage. I mean, it's all crazy. Uh, I mean, like, what for those who haven't, seeing that stuff like what are they saying about it it's even more fanciful that oh that it was an fbi put this doing. up to begin with you know mm -hmm. that that's that the fbi wrote all of Steele's memos that mm -hmm. that reporters that this was all intentional on the part of the media these weren't mistakes these weren't like you know mistakes this was part of a plot when they're and also lying about the role of the dossier in the FBI original. Yes, and that, oh yeah, this is a, that the FBI would have the never started thing. this without yeah. the dossier. But, you know, the main theme is the media sucks, um, which are allowed, certainly, to have 
that opinion, and I'm very critical of the media in my book. But, you know, this now goes one step further, which is, well, you know what? All these people were in on this to begin with. They were all part of the conspiracy. This, this was not an accident. These were not errors. This was all a, a plot, right? And it's all fucking crazy. Yeah. It's crazy well, and, talk. And, yeah, and this is the sort of the circumstance that Steele and the, you know, the, the, to the extent his research was embraced, like that's the circumstance that, that people have created. But in trying to harm Trump, they actually are enabling him because they were so sloppy and yeah, because yeah. fusion was so dishonest. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, and I think, you know, unfortunately the media has enabled that because they allowed fusion to set the rules of the game. And, and that yeah. was the media's big mistake, but to like jump from that to say, you know, they didn't make a mistake they were in on this from the beginning that's you know in my view total bullshit yeah um well so um i mean but i i mean to some degree why this situation happened is that um you know a, a lot of media organizations have cut back their they're spending on investigative journalism. And so now you have groups like Fusion, but not just Fusion. Um, there's lots of these organizations and uh, they're getting paid by people um, who have lots of money to you know, c come up with dirt, true or not. And um, news organizations, you know, in many cases are buying it or falling for it, not just with this document. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, um, there's a market for um, information that is uh, gathered by corporate investigators. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not one that's saying that reporters shouldn't look at this. They shouldn't accept information from corporate investigators. Sometimes, you know, corporate investigators have spent six months investigating something that may be of public interest. Yeah. What I am saying is that if a news organization decides to use information uh, from a, that's been gathered by a public investigator or confirms it, you know, if they confirm it independently even, that they owe it to a reader, to a viewer, a listener, whomever, to the public, uh, to make them aware that there is someone in this story with an axe to grind who's being paid to, you know, to gather information. This story did not happen because Barry Meyer or some other reporter woke up in the morning with a bright idea to go, you know, like, let's say, investigate Matthew Sheffield. This story is happening because it just so happens that Matthew Sheffield has a lot of enemies or one very rich enemy who's been uh, paying these investigators to dig up information because he wants to torpedo Matthew Sheffield. And, and I think we need to be clear that, you know, there are people involved in this story. Uh, there's a dispute going on related to this story and that, you know, there people are gathering information. Yeah. Um, well, now what's been the, reaction that you've had from people in the media to your points here on this regard? I mean, most of it has been uh, favorable. I mean, there have been a couple of people who, particularly some of my former colleagues at the Wall Street Journal who are very close to Fusion, who have been very unhappy with me, uh, such is life. Uh, but um, I think there is uh, an awareness. And I think it's you know, sinking in, you know, if it hadn't sunk in before, it's certainly sinking in now with these latest Danchenko uh, uh, revelations. You know, uh, you know, uh, there was an op-ed just the other day, two days ago, in the New York Times by Bill Gruskin, who used to be at the Wall Street Journal and now is a professor at Columbia Journalism Review, basically saying that, look, 
if the media wants to reclaim its credibility, it needs to basically put its cards on the table, you know, and kind of do autopsies, public autopsies of how it handled the dossier. Uh, you know, and he pointed to other cases like, you know, the, 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 the reporting on me, uh, weapons of mass destruction, on um, the Wen Ho Lee story about the alleged Chinese, you know, spy. And, um, uh, and, I, and I believe that also. I mean, I believe that um, the longer... Look, I don't know what's going to happen with the Durham investigation. That is the, the new investigation by this... Uh, uh, counsel that was appointed by Bill Barr to look into uh, the Trump Russia probe. But none of it, whatever happens, none of it is going to be good for the news media. I think we saw that with the Igor Danchenko indictment. And the best way for the media to exercise itself exercise this this episode put it behind uh itself is simply to come clean here's what we did here's what we did wrong here's what we're not going to do going forward it's it's not that complicated yeah all right well i appreciate appreciate you coming on the show today barry um thanks matthew it's it a real a pleasure good, yeah it's been a great discussion so um so barry meyer is the author of spooked the Trump dossier, Black Cube, and the Rise of Private Spies. And he is on Twitter at B A R R Y M E I E R. So thanks for being here today. And uh, we'll uh, catch you next time. All right, Matthew. Okay. All, right. All right. Well, so that was our discussion about the Trump Russia dossier and its impact uh, five years after the fact. Um, and uh, so I hope hope this was an interesting discussion for everyone. And um, just wanted to mention as we are heading it, wrapping up here that uh, Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. And Flux is a new community of podcasters and writers that looks in depth at media and politics and religion and technology and how they all intersect. So please check that out at flux.community. And uh, we also, if you, like what we're what we're doing here at Theory of Change, uh, we have you can go to our website at uh, well, looks like the Chiron's not working there <laughs> um, at theoryofchange.show and uh, follow us there. And then uh, also you can go to Patreon.com/discoverflux if you want to support our work with that. So I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me today, everyone, and I will see you next time. <laughs>